Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,334 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are delivering the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over this past year. This is the ninth of an 11 series message covering the letter to the Philippians. This message is titled, Hanging Tough and Looking Up. I pray that it'll be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. I do appreciate everyone being here. And those who'll be watching online a little bit later of our sermons here at Putnam. Now, last week we focused on the comparison message as we looked at a humble rubbish versus divine righteousness. And we learned that all human efforts to live a life that's pleasing to God apart from Christ are pointless and fruitless. And today we're going to focus on standing firm without, sta- or without standing still in a message titled, Hanging Tough, But Looking Up. And our passage today is Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. It's on page 1829 of your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along, starting with verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal. I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, and just as you have had us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have told you often before, and now I tell you even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, we live in a predominantly humanistic society. I don't think anyone would uh, say that that's not true. It's not uncommon for the glories of humanity to be exalted in exaggerated terms. Our open-minded media parades before our eyes immoral living as a virtue. They promise social progress through secular and even anti-Christian means. From politics to education, from spirituality to ethics. Our sophisticated 21st century world functions on the presumption that the only thing that's standing in the way is the backward thinking of those Neanderthals who can't pull their nose out of that ancient, outdated book called the Bible. Yet God has chosen to leave us as believers here on earth, not to retreat from the pain and suffering that we see around us, but to engage in it, to be up close and personal with those that are struggling. This calling requires us to strap in, sometimes for a bumpy ride of life, to hang in there, hang tough over that long haul. We're on this rough road between when Christ appeared the first time in the flesh and when he'll come again to restore God's kingdom. But we must keep our heads up. We must keep our eyes forward and we must keep our hearts heavenward during this time that God has permitted us to be here on earth. The Christian life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not a hundred yard dash. And it's not through level paved streets of a clean and friendly city at times, but across rocky, strenuous, dangerous terrain that's filled with pitfalls and even predators. But it's comforting to know that we're not the first Christians to make this journey through a wicked and hostile world. And if you think about it, in many ways, our world today is much better off than it ever has been in all of human history. 
Although it might not seem like it, if we just looked at the modern day news coverage, there's actually less war, less poverty, less oppression, and less death at an early age, now more than ever. And that's with a population that's con continuing to increase exponentially. So the Christian influence in this world is making a difference. The kingdom of God is spreading throughout the world, although we might not see it if we only look at the headline news. Those who have gone before us has cut the path for us to follow. And that's what our passage today in Philippians is about. The Apostle Paul establishes several markers along this route that we're on, this rough terrain, that are important truths to take to heart and practical advice for us to follow as we hang tough and look up. The problem is, as we're walking along, trudging, too many times we're looking down instead of looking up at what the Lord has for us. So let's look at verses 12 through 16 first. When Christ confronted the Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, as described in Acts chapter 9, his whole world was turned upside down. But when you think of it, actually, as our series on the Her Sermon on the Mount told us, Christ finally turned the world right side up. Paul had been leaning on the laurels, relying on his religion, trusting in his tradition, and priding himself in his pedigree. But that all disintegrated on that road to Damascus and the glorious transforming power of the gospel of Christ. He experienced salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And from that moment on, joy entered into his life, but it wasn't that surface happiness that we have. This was true abiding, deep-seated joy that could keep him singing in the darkest, dampest prison cells in the most de depressing circumstances. But this doesn't mean that Paul had arrived, that he had reached, reached the apex. His Damascus Road experience didn't pluck him from earth and place him in the foyer of the heavenly kingdom. Instead, it turned him from the wrong path that he was on and sent him down the right path, the new journey that God has given to him. A new quest for Christ's likeness had commenced for Paul. The obstacles that were in the path in his way were distractions from the world that was becoming even more dangerous, requiring him, now that he was in Christ, to press on, as he tells us in verse 12. And we can see several vital principles here, profound descriptions of Paul's journey that we can apply to our own lives. And I found five reminders of Paul that were important to share that we're on the same path. And this is in your bulletin insert on the side. It says, hanging tough and looking up. These are Paul's profound journey of faith. And he wants to share those with us today. The first principle he wants to share is God's plan is progress, not perfection, in verse 12. And Paul was clear on this. In verse 12, he says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. He knew he had not. Paul was on the same path as every one of us are on today. He had been justified. That means he was declared right with God that allowed him to boldly go before God's throne now. And that was based on the merits of Christ, just like all of us are. He was in the process of being sanctified, made right with God, as he looked forward to that one day when he would be glorified, made completely holy through the resurrection. Now, perfection in this life is completely impossible. We are frail, we're fallen, we're feeble humans, and we'll continue on like that until our death. Not only are we imperfect, but so was every one of you around us. I know I'm imperfect, but if I had to guess, I'd probably say most of you guys are too. The best, the most moral, the most Christ-like person who has ever lived is still a sinner saved by grace, unable to be compared to that perfect standard of holiness that we see in Christ Jesus. But constant progress toward Christ's likeness is possible. We can become more like Christ every day, even if we don't ever reach perfection in this life. But I've seen believers who are frustrated for their lack of stunning progress in pursuing Christ's likeness. I've seen them trying to pursue it in their own efforts, and all they do is get worn out because of that. 
I've seen them fall and fail. They get down on themselves for their inability to measure up to that impossible standard in their life, which is Jesus Christ. And this is precisely where we need to hear that our life is a life of progress as we strive to become more like Christ, not perfection. We press on despite knowing that we'll never fully arrive at Christ's likeness, at least not in this life. The second principle Paul wanted for us today is the past is over. Leave it behind in verse 13. We can press on through the long haul by keeping our eyes on the road ahead of us instead of obsessively being fixated on everything that happened in the past, whether it be good or bad. To emphasize this point, Paul uses a Greek word that means to disregard or put out of our mind everything that happened in the past that's dragging us down away from Christ's likeness. Paul isn't talking about forgetting people of our past. It amazes me, Janice remembers people 50, 60, 70, probably 80 years ago. I can't remember people's names just standing up here at the pulpit. So that we don't forget the people of our past. We don't disregard those, but we move forward. Paul's talking about forgetting that rubbish that was strewn in the road of that old life before he met Christ, before Christ exploded his self-righteousness, his striving, and his harm that he caused in his old life before Christ. All of his pride, all of his arrogance, all his blasphemy, all of his heresy, and we could put ourselves right in Paul's shoes because we are capable of that also. Living in the past, whether it's basking in our old glories or pouting over our old defeats, keeps us from advancing in our Christ-like walk today in the future. Think about it. Have you ever tried driving your car and only looking in your rearview mirror? I would say you wouldn't get very far before you ran off the road. So you can't dwell on the past if your goal is to move forward in the future. In relationship to basking in the past, I find people who are living in the glory of their past achievement. Well, in the past, I did this or that. And it slackens their, their efforts to be able to move forward in the future. We can't rest on our past laurels. They keep calling to mind the way things were. Perhaps we should go back to those days when God accomplished great things that he performed in our lives or in our country or in this world. But the wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10, 7, verse 10 he says, don't long for the good old days. That is not wise. Because if we really reflect on those good old days, they're not as good as what they, we've conjured up in our minds to think that they were. I'd not, we'd rather live in today and in the future than any time in the past. But we see this some um, in our older churches, and Putnam being an older church could fall prey to this. We wish we had things as they once were, but we can't do that. We don't want to dishonor our history, but we need to minister in the here and now. The gospel of Christ never changes, but how we minister to others does change as our culture changes so that we can minister most effectively. We want to honor the past. We want to be thankful for the past and how God worked in our lives, but we want to learn from the past. We don't want to worship the past or dwell there. With respect over pouting over our past, I'm sure that we've all had times when we could not get out of our mind and stop rerunning the defeats or the episodes or even the good times of our lives in our mind. We have them all. All of every, every one of us at times falls into that where we want to be in the past. These experiences can, though, be great teachers for us of God's faithfulness despite our own failures, despite our own victories. But to keep projecting that same reel over and over and over of what we did in the past in our minds hinders us from engaging those new experiences new memories and learning new lessons that God wants for us for today. The third principle that Paul has for us today is the future holds out hope. So let's reach for that hope in verses 13 and 14. 
In that same pivotal moment in which Paul can consciously lets go of the past, he turns his full attention to the future, and he says in verse 14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And I'll draw your attention to the graphic there at the bottom of the bulletin insert, I press on, in the strenuous exercise that this lady's going through. Here Paul employs a language reflecting an intensity of an athlete running in a desperate race to the finish line, eager to win first place. And the word translated straining forward here is a vivid athletic term. And one commentator notes, it means that an athlete throws himself forward into the race with all the energy strained to the very utmost, as this lady running up these steps pictures. If earthly athletes can give their all for temporal awards, how much more should we, the recipients of that heavenly call, push ourselves to receive the heavenly awards? Paul's fourth reminder to us is, the secret is a determined attitude, so maintain that attitude. Verse 15. Paul reminds us, it's all about our attitude. The verb translated to take such a view is phronio, and it means to set one's mind on or to be intent on, in light of the example of looking forward, not looking backwards. Paul calls his readers to focus their attention and energy on pressing forward into Christ's Christian life. There's a quote from Chuck Swindoll, who was a pastor for many decades, and uh, president of the Dallas Theological Seminary, that I think sums it up best. It's one of my favorite quotes. And he says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failure, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance giftedness or skill, it will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding our attitude that we'll embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is to play on that one string that we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me in 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We all are in charge of our attitudes. And I think that quote sums up my philosophy of life. It's our attitude that makes a difference between a good day and a bad day. We all struggle at times. We all run into difficulties, challenges in life. But it's our attitude on how we look at it, on how we're going to allow all that to affect our lives. Paul stated that he had not re yet reached the end of his journey, which would only occur when he attained his heavenly home and experienced a glorious, immortal life, that life beyond the resurrection in verses 10 and 11 of this chapter. And the same immortality was certainly not in Paul's present life, nor is it in our life until Christ returns. And until then, we would continue to press forward to greater and greater Christ-likeness. In verses 15 and 16, Paul uses a similar distinct term, the adjective in Greek, teleios, to describe a type of person that he addresses with this warning to press on. Paul graciously acknowledges that everybody grows up in Christ at different paces. It's a spiritual marathon that we're all involved in. Some people are nearing that finish line, and they're racing as fast as they can toward it. Others are much farther behind. Some are limping at a snail's pace, and others need to be dragged along by those of us that can help them. Paul knew that not everybody was the same or in the same condition for running this marathon of faith, but he was confident that God would continue his work in them until the upward call of Jesus Christ. And Paul's fifth reminder today is, the need is to keep a high standard by keeping it together as believers. Did you notice that Paul shifted his focus from himself as an example in verses 12 through 14? 
and included all believers in the journey in verses 15 and 16 by saying, all of us, living this Christian life is a team effort. It is not a solo mission. None of us can do it on our own. Each of us is to maintain our own level of spiritual maturity, but we're also to encourage others in doing the same. We are to lock arms with brothers and sisters in Christ because we're all part of the family of God. If we see one of our family members slowing down, we need to come alongside them and encourage them to continue on. We must take them by the arm and encourage them to press on. When we see someone out of breath because of the exasperating challenges and difficulties of life, we need to remind them to look up, to look forward, and look press on toward maturity. Which brings us to verses 17 through 21. In these concluding verses of this chapter, Paul takes on a serious tone just for a short moment. And he reminds his readers that something that he learned through his own personal experiences. The path before us is not only littered with numerous pitfalls that are slowed down or distract us from our faith walk, but it is also occupied by predators. In verse 18, he calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. They sometimes look like us. Oftentimes, they appear to be trudging on that same path that we're on. In light of it, a real threat, though, Paul instructs his Philippians to press on. Let me sum up the instructions in three simple statements that Paul gave us here. I will call these as marching orders, and these are also found in your bulletin insert. And these are from marching orders from a Christian who was a seasoned veteran enduring the countless battles of his life. The first marching order is we need godly examples to follow in verse 17. In order to live as salt and light in this dark world, we need mature models to follow. Models like Paul and his faith. Experienced saints who have faced challenges, who have lived through tragedies, who have overcome obstacles in their life. And Paul expresses a similar thought in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, when he says, And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. But why doesn't Paul just say, well, just imitate Christ instead? Why point to himself as a mere human example? It's because God has intentionally given us contemporary models of which to follow. Believers that we can look to and say, if they can do it, I can do it. Because they, like us, are fallen. They're frail human beings. They're indwelled by that same spirit, though, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. They, like us, are striving for Christ's likeness, not perfection, but progress toward Christ's likeness. They, like us, seek to live God honoring lives in the midst of a twisted, corrupt, and sinful world. When we look at Christ, we see perfection that will one day reflect, but not yet. But when we look at imperfect men and women that we can follow, Growing to be more like Christ, we can see who we are and that we do have a path forward. In this life, we'll never measure up to that God-man, Jesus Christ, but we can follow the steps of godly men and women. What kind of person makes a good model to follow along this dangerous path? Paul answers this question in a letter that he wrote toward the end of his life to his beloved protege, Timothy, his apprentice who had been with him for decades. And Paul wrote this to him. He said, but you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and, how, and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much I've been persecuted and suffering that I've endured. You know all about the, how I was persecuted in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from all of them. See, at this point, some people might think, well, yeah, that was the Apostle Paul. I can see why Timothy would want to follow the Apostle Paul, but we don't have apostles today. But Paul goes on to tell us in our passage today in verse 17, Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your life after mine and learn from those who follow my example. So he turned their attention not just to himself, but to examples of other Christians living a Christ-like life in this world. See, God has given each of us persons in our lives to live admirable lives that we can follow. And there's nothing wrong. In fact, there's everything right with following examples of godly people. 
The only warning is not to idolize them or put them on a pedestal. Now, if they wouldn't want to be put on a pedestal, if they're truly Christ-like in their walk, so choose to study spiritual heroes carefully, study their lives, and follow only those who genuinely seek to want to be more like Christ. Now, Paul has a second marching order for us today. He says, we live among the enemies of the cross, in verses 18 and 19. In these verses, Paul uses just a basic contrast. After urging the Philippians to follow a godly pattern of believers in verse 17, he gives us a reason in verse 18. For as I have often told you before, and now telling you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. So Paul used this description in verses 18 and 19, the negative characteristics of their attitudes to show us a contrast of how we should live, because they were so destructive that it made Paul weep. And they give us an idea of the kind of positive examples on the other side of that that we need in our lives to counter those numerous purveyors of evil. They were destined to eternal hopelessness. They were driven by their sexual appetites. They were dedicated to material things. These men and women who have rejected Christ and his person and his work, they were lost, wandering souls, and that made Paul weep. And we bump into these people every day as we journey through this life. But they don't need our condemnation or our judgment but neither do they need our agreement or our affirmation of a lifestyle that's contrary to God's word. They need to be reconciled to Christ. They need to become allies and not enemies of the cross. So as we travel along our path following the good examples of godliness, we can't forget that God has left us in this world in order to minister to those who are still lost. Our mission is to call them to these believers to accept the one that they've rejected, to submit to his kingdom and to enter into his heavenly citizenship, which takes us to Paul's third marching order. We belong to those bound for heaven, in verses 20 and 21. See, Paul dwells on the unbelieving evildoers for only a moment in verses 18 and 19. He says, this is a snapshot, but let's look at what's important. He needed to warn the Philippians of the contrast, the way of the enemies of the path of believers, but then he quickly turns it back into a positive, as he so often does. He says, our future hope as heaven-bound citizens of Christ's kingdom. In verse 19, he says, their minds were set on earthly things, but as believers in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. We do this by always looking forward, looking upward, and eagerly awaiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his second coming as our Savior. Now, the Greek word Paul uses for citizenship here is polyuma, and it means commonwealth or state. And Paul uses it to convey a, our homeland that isn't here on earth at this point in time. Our place or our residence is entirely in a yet unseen realm. That makes us expert, expats. Expat means a colony of foreigners here on earth. But we don't need to see ourselves as helpless refugees huddled in an overcrowded refugee camp. No, we're more like ambassadors, emissaries, and representatives of the next world as we live in this present world. It's like it's going to a foreign country as an ambassador representing that country that we've come from or part of. And that's what we are as believers. Yes, one day the king will come. Verse 21 says, we'll transform our lowly body so that we will be like his glorious body. And he'll escort us to our final home, our heavenly home. You see, this remade earth, when Christ returns and sets up God's kingdom here on earth, the world will be remade into a global Eden. And as Revelation tells us, heaven will come down, that new Jerusalem, and heaven and earth will become one, and that's where we'll dwell for all eternity with immortal bodies, with changed bodies. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
then we will, we will be with the Lord forever. He says, so encourage each other with these words. One day, we will be home in our new eternal global Eden, where heaven and earth become one. Now this long, arduous journey that we're on will finally come to an end. Whether it's a sprint toward the finish line or limping along this path on a daily basis, we'll stand together victoriously, clothed in glory. Finally, an immortal body that will never die, that will never age, that will never have pain or suffering once again because we'll have the body that Christ had after his resurrection. We don't understand it fully, but we know Christ passed through walls. He went from one point to another instantly. That's the type of immortal bodies that we will have. Finally, we'll be free from pain and sorrow in this world, reunited with those loved ones, those saints who have gone before us, rejoicing eternally in Christ our King. And that takes us to our application for today on the other side of your bulletin insert. Application of Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. It's standing firm without standing still. And throughout Paul's letter to the Philippians, there is a focus on the Lord as our source and our ability to stand firm with confidence, with joy and strength. However, we must never confuse standing, with, standing firm with standing still. A lot of things in this messed up world can cause us to wear out and stall in our Christian walk. But God didn't put us here to huddle in a corner, to hide in a crevice, or to hurry ourselves to heaven. He called us to make a difference where we are in our world today. To be insulated from the wickedness of the world, but not isolated from the world itself. So to help us stand firm without standing still, let me ask three probing questions. There are sets of questions here. They might even be a bit meddling, but allow it to be meddling in yourself. And these questions arise from this passage today. But don't rush through these questions this week. Study them, ponder them, mull them over, talk about them with others. Let them urge you to think through areas of your spiritual walk that you need to address in your life, as I do in mine. The first set of questions is, are you dwelling in the past, letting it control your attitudes and your actions? Are you letting go of things that happened in the past so long ago, setting your mind on things above and continuing to take steps toward maturity? I strongly suggest memorizing those epic words of Paul, Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. The second set of questions are, are you following good examples? Do you have a Paul to look up to, a Timothy to imitate, an Epaphroditus to follow, a godly hero to learn from? Do you look up, have people to look up to, to spend time with, to learn from their lives and their qualities of Christ that wants to see formed in you? Or do you need to seek a mentor more like what Paul had in mind? And the third set of questions are, are you eagerly anticipating the coming of Christ? Do you live today by the principles of your eternal home? Would the enemies of the cross in this world realize that this world is not your home? Or do you blend in so well that you compromise and hide your identity in Christ? Are there people in your life today, friends, family members, neighbors, co-workers, who need to hear the word of testimony and encouragement, a warning from you as a heavenly ambassador? Are there areas of your life that are having a negative impact on others? What areas do we need to change in our lives? We can start right now. Today, we're looking at standing or hanging tough by looking up and then standing firm without standing still. And this is what Paul wants to get across to us in this passage. How can we live lives to impact the world today? Yes, we could use mentors to help us along, but we also want to grow to the point where we become mentors for others. And that is the focus of today, to press on, not to live in the past, but to press on to be more like Christ. Now next week we'll continue studying Philippians, focusing on the final part of Philippians, which is joy in resting. And we'll discover how we can find or fight for peace in a message titled, A Cure for Anger and Anxiety. 
And if you either have either of those in your lives, next week's message will help us to deal with anger and anxiety. So please read Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9 in preparation for next week. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for this passage today. We thank you that we can press on to become more like Christ. We thank you that we can wait in anticipation of Christ returning to set up your kingdom here on earth. And we'll have be changed in a blink of an eye to immortal bodies that will live forever with you. We're looking and anticipating and for that day, Father. Help us to hang tough. Stay firm without standing still as we proclaim the gospel of Christ through our lives and through our actions and through our speech to those around us, Father. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together... Let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.